at this point, we should have a pretty good handle on how to define classes and, and objects. Um, and what we're going to do next is two things. We're going to define a new class. It's called the student class. I'll show it in a minute. Um, and we're going to just sort of practice all the concepts that we have before. And I'm also going to describe some best practices when defining classes and the various member functions. And then in the subsequent lecture, you are going to build for a drill a course class that will use this student class. So again, that same concept that we saw with eyes, faces, and crowds, the ability to build more and more complex uh, entities from these simpler classes, which again is a very important concept. So let's just go ahead and dig in and look at my student class. So here's a very, very simple student class. Let me just start with the constructor, and then I'll fill in the member functions in a little bit. This class is somewhat simplistic. I'm only going to store three pieces of information, the name, a single exam grade, and a height in centimeters. Completely random and arbitrary. I just wanted to pass in three parameters. Obviously, for a full-blown student class, you'd have a lot more information here, like homework grades and several exam grades, and maybe their student ID and what class they're in. Um, and, but for now, let's just, for simplicity, just store these three pieces of information. So the only thing the constructor is going to do is take these three parameters, all must be passed in, and shove them into the variable, into the object with variable name, name, grade, and height. Okay? So that's it for the constructor. No optional parameters, nothing else, just three pieces of information. Tell me what they are, and I will create a student for you. And now you have to start thinking about functionality. What do you want to offer? And that is going to depend on sort of the situation, right? What is this going to be used for? Um, I think probably one of the first things you should always define is a print function. Because at this point, you probably know that printing is a really nice and simple way to debug your code. Create a student, print it out, see if it's uh, correct. Uh, change something associated with the student, print it out, see if it's correct. So printing is always a really nice, simple way to debug. And so let's just go ahead and get in the habit after creating our constructor, underbar, underbar, init, underbar, go ahead and just create a print statement. Um, underbar, underbar, str, underbar, underbar. So here you have some choices, right? So I've got three pieces of information associated with a student. I may have more. You may decide, I don't want to print all these pieces of information. I just want some of the information, not all of it. That's a choice you're going to have to make. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print everything because there's only three pieces of information and it's relatively easy to do. But if there's more, maybe you want to create some condensed version of the object so it's easy to view. Maybe you don't. Maybe you want to print it all out and be able to import it into a CSV file down the line. So here, all I'm going to do is print out uh, an open paren to start, a closed paren to end, and then comma delimited. There's a comma right there, and there's a comma right there. I'm going to just print the name, the grade, and the height. Be really careful, by the way. Notice here that the grade is a number, the height is a number, the name is a string, so I have to make sure to convert any numbers to string when I do the string concatenation. Remember also that you're returning in the print function. You yourself in this function are not printing. You are handing back to the Python print function a string, which it will take responsibility for dumping out into the console or Jupyter Notebook cell. All right, so just as a good habit, just write a print statement, make some decisions on what you want to print out, and it can change over time. You may decide later on you want to add or remove some information. Good. So let's go through the practice of defining a, uh, a, an object and, and doing a few things. So I'm going to call the uh, a, object, a constructor for the class student. Uh, again, remember that by convention, but not necessary, objects are typically named with a capital letter. Um, I need to pass in three values, a name, an exam grade, and a height in centimeters. So Alice 92160 go into the constructor. Constructor builds an object. It hands back me that address. I'm going to store that into little a there. And of course, when I call uh, print of a, it calls that str function that we defined on the previous slide, and it prints Alice 92160, comma delimited with parent. And at this point, that's all I can do because my class has no other functionality, we're obviously going to add a little bit of functionality in a minute. Now, I might want to, instead of just printing out the entire object, I may want to ask, I'm curious about Alice's height or Alice's grade. And so when I say A equals student, A is an object, and I have access to the data, the height, the grade, and the name, and I have access to all the member functions. Right now it's only print, but we'll add a few bit more, a few more. So I can certainly say, hand me back the height of object A or the grade of object A. 
this is generally considered bad form. All right, this is why I say here in the comment, don't do this. When you build an object, you should be abstracting out the data part. The user who defines an object shouldn't have to know what the name of the variable is. They have to know the name of the functions, that's obvious, but they shouldn't have to know this. They shouldn't know that you're storing this in a variable called height. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is if you want to make changes to the class, then, and, and I've hardwired a bunch of variable names in here, and you decide, okay, we're no longer going to store the grade as a single variable, we're going to store it as a list. Now, anybody who's written code like this is in a little bit of trouble. Whereas if you force them to get access to it through a function, I'm going to show you that in a minute, you can then make changes to your data, make changes to your function, and nothing changes out here. So because code is not static, because code is always changing, you add things, you remove things, you modify things, you don't want people who use your class to have to hardwire uh, information like this. It's a bad form. And as a general rule, you, you, the user shouldn't have access to those data fields. They have access to the functionality. Now you can't prevent them from doing this, but you should give them the functionality to access the data. And that is done with what are called accessor functions. So this is my class student, here's my constructor, here's my print statement, and I've written here, you can see three functions. Get name, get grade, get height. That of course corresponds to the name, grade, and height that are being stored as data. And notice these are incredibly simple functions. Uh, single parameter, self, the address of the object that you're being called with, and then simply return the object's name, the object's grade, the object's height. And notice the difference here, these, these seem like trivial functions, they are. But now imagine I make a change to something simple like the name of the variable, I change the name here, that can stay the same, and everything works. Anybody who has built their code on my class, they have no impact. Or let's say I decide to, to change grades, I'm going to store multiple grades, I can then simply change this one line of code, and this continues to work, and I can add some more functionality below. And so then this little bit of code here, so I'm going to define an object here, same as before, this bit of code then gets turned into this bit of code. And it's more or less the same, but what's the difference? Here I'm calling a function, here I'm directly accessing the little data element. And this is considered better form. Um, some programming languages, Java for example, you can write classes where this is simply not allowed. You can't tap into the data, everything has to be done through these types of accessor functions. Python doesn't have that kind of restriction, but as a rule, this is what you should do. You should create the ability, if you think your user, the person using your class, needs access to these individual fields, write a little function that simply returns it, and then I will have access to it with that functionality, and then you can tell me what the functions are and how to do these things. Okay, so let's, um, by way of practice, and I'm gonna introduce a few more concepts, Let's also remember that in addition to creating an object, I can create lists of objects. And we've already seen a few examples of that for storing multiple students. It sounds a little bit like what you're going to do in your drill, uh, in the course drill in the next lecture. So here, for example, I'm defining a list called student list. It's equal to open square bracket, close square bracket. I put these backslashes here because this, uh, it didn't fit all on one line. I'm creating three objects, Alice, Bob, Chelsea, with exam 92, 160, 42, 165, 76, 162. And so this will build a list with three elements, index at 0, 1, 2, and they will contain object, object, object. Hey, no problem, we've seen this before already when we built uh, the crowds, for example. Now, let's say I wanna do some operations on this. Let's say I wanna print, for example, um, all of the students in my class which are now being represented as this student list. So how would I do that? Well, obviously this is a list, so I'm going to use an iterative construct to iterate through the elements of the list. For i in range, zero to the length of the student list. Zero, one, two. That number of course is three, but the range only returns zero to one minus that. So i will take on the value zero, one, two. And then what do I wanna do? I simply wanna print the ith element of the list. So when I call print student list, which is that thing right there, sub i, it reaches in and grabs an object. And then when I print an object, it calls the str function associated with the student class. So this, of course, will print everybody in the list. Good, super easy to do. Now, let's say I want to figure out uh, who's failing the course. 
Yeah, and I, so I want to print all the students that are failing. So that is their exam grade is below, say, 65. Yeah. So how would I do that? Well, so I certainly have to iterate through everybody, but now I need a conditional. I need to check what is that student's grade. And then depending on that, I either will print them or not print them. So let's write that little bit of code, and then I'm going to teach you a little bit more about uh, functionality here. So same for loop as before for i in range 0 to the length of the student list. Um, if student list sub i, what is student list sub i? Again, I reach into that list. I reach into the ith element, which is an object. What do I want for that object? I want that object's grade. I'm not going to ask for the grade. I'm, I, by accessing the grade data, I'm going to call get grade. So student list sub i is an object. Call get grade associated with that object. That will hand back 92, 42, or 76. Compare that to 65, and if it is less than, then please print out for me that student's name. And of course, in this case, only Bob is failing the class. Okay, nothing wrong with that code. But if you think that the functionality of asking whether a student is failing is useful, well, then you should offer that functionality. I shouldn't have to write the conditional. You should create a function inside the class called is failing. And is failing should hand back to me whether somebody is failing or not. So this is a really subtle difference, but notice what I'm doing here. It's what I did with the accessor functions. I'm taking the work, and I will admit that in this case it's not a lot of hard work, and I'm embedding it inside of the class. Because when I use a class, I, the goal here is that the class offers the functionality that I need, and I'm just sort of putting the pieces together. I shouldn't have to write that conditional. You should have to write the conditional. You should tell me what failing is. I shouldn't decide what failing is. You should. So let's go ahead and write that function in is failing. Well, in this case, it's a one-line function. All I have to do is return self.grade less than 65. Let me take a second here to also make a point about this one line of code. I could have written this code as if self.grade is less than 65 return true, else return false. Four lines of code. But notice that what I'm returning is what evaluated to in the conditional. And so this is just, we've done this, I've said this before, and I want to just reemphasize it. When you are returning a Boolean, if all you are going to do is check, check this and then return true or false, just return this, because this returns true or false. One line of code, very elegant, very clean, and shows that you understand how to code without having to write unnecessary lines of code. And so now that I have this function is failing, let's go look at the code. So this is what we had before we wrote our conditional. And now all I have to do is say, if student list sub i is failing, then please print out. And notice here, it, there's a very small distinction, very similar to that distinction that we made with the accessor. But the idea of these classes is that you are building up functionality. And you are deciding, because you are the student class, what failing is. Now, you may say, hey, look, we don't decide who's failing. That's your responsibility. Well, then this code makes sense. But if the student class wants to decide what failing is, well, then you should create the functionality and not force me to make a conditional based on some number that maybe you decide what failing is and not me. Okay. So this distinction between you know, what should be a built-in functionality in the class and what should the user do is an interesting one. And there's no right or wrong answers. But the more functionality you build, first of all, it's easier to maintain that class because I don't want somebody else writing a different line of code and maybe writing a different number there. If we're going to decide on what failing is, maybe it should be centralized and not for every other person to define. Now, on the other hand, you may decide I don't want to be in the business of deciding who's failing. Well, then you don't want to do this, or maybe you want to pass in a parameter and then have your function make that decision. All right. So let's look at a few more things. Um, so what's another thing you might want to do with a bunch of students? You might want to sort them. You might want to sort them based sort of on the grade, for example, or on the name, or perhaps you want to know who's the tallest and the shortest person in the class. So let's see how to do that. Well, I have a list, and we know how to sort lists. We've actually done that before. So if student list is a list, there's a built-in function called sort. And sort will sort alphanumerically. But something's a little weird here, because how does sort know what to sort on? Those are objects, right? They're not, they're not strings. They're not numbers. They're not floats. And so this, in fact, won't work. And it won't work because the sort function doesn't know what order you want. Do you want it on the name? Do you want it on the grade? Do you want it on the height? Um, and, and these are just objects. It's, it's not a, it's, there's, there's no natural ordering here. 
And so you can't just do this, but this is the good, that's the bad news. The good news is Python gives you some nice functionality, um, which is that you can define a function called, and this is outside of notice, the class. So I'm going to call this function key grade. It takes as input an object called, I'm going to call it student. And in my case, I'm going to return that student's grade. I'm going to decide that when I sort this function, which I'm going to show you how to do in a second, I want to sort on the grade. I may decide on a different key that I want to sort on. So this is why I called it key grade. I may have another one that says key name, and it returns the name of the student. So all this function does is it takes an object as input, and it returns some property of the object. Okay? Now, that property has to be something that is indexable, sort of, sortable on. So in this case, of course, it is because it's just a number. And now, the way you call sort is very similar, but you have to tell it what you want to sort on. So student list is the list. Sort is the same that we had before, but in parentheses here now, you have to tell me what do you want to sort on. So key equals, that's the keyword that you have to use, and then the name of the function. My function I just called key grade. It will then use this function for every object, extract the grade, of course, all of this is being done behind the scenes, and then when you uh, print, it will print in increasing order of the grade, 42, 76, uh, 92, okay? So you just have to tell when you want to sort on objects, what part of the object do you want to sort on? Write a little function to do that, pass it to the sort function, and it will do the hard work for you. Okay, good. So a couple of things we did here. One was just review. We, we built another uh, um, object, another class rather, constructor, a couple of accessor functions. A couple of best practices. Write those little functions that access the data field so that users aren't tapping directly into them. And think about functionality. Think about what you want in that class. And because the more you give, the easier it is for the developer, for the programmer to use it. Is, you know, what's the right answer? How much is too much? How much is too little? That's that's a bit of the art of programming that you will learn over time as you build these classes and you see what other people do. All right, that's it for now. When we come back, I'm going to have you do a drill, uh, which is to build a course class using the student class and then building some functionality into that. So I'll see you in a few minutes and we'll come back to that.